testing. To me, we are looking at biochemistry lab testing and sort of lab tests that take place in the biochemistry department. So, first of all, bloods, hematology. So you have hemoglobin, which gives the red colours, red cells, red blood cells their colour and carries the oxygen from the test from the lungs to the cells. So this test is primarily used to determine the presence of anemia or is reverse polycythemia. So the red blood cell count is measured to measure the number of red cells in the blood. A low red, red blood cell count often accompanies anemia, excess body fluid and blood loss. A high count is commonly seen in dehydration and polycythemia. You also have something that's measured called the hematocrit, which measures, measures the percentage of red blood cells in a standard volume of blood. It is used in conjunction with the hemoglobin and red cell count, red blood cell count to determine the presence of type of anemia. So we also look at red blood cell properties which give an indication of what type of anemia it is. You have the mean cell volume, MCV, which measures the average volume of red cells. You have the MCH, which is the mean cell hemoglobin, which measures the weight of hemoglobin in the average red cell. You have mean cell hemoglobin concentration, which measures the weight of hemoglobin in a standard volume of blood. And you have red cell distribution width, which measures the degree of size variation in the blood cells. Platelets are always measured, which, which measures the number of platelets in the blood, and that's a platelet count. Platelets help the blood clot at sight of a wound. You have high platelet counts can be seen following strenuous activity in some infections and inflammatory conditions. You have extremely low platelet counts can be associated with spontaneous bleeding. There's also white blood cells measured as well. So white blood cells protect against infection and allergies. High counts are seen during infection after exercise and with stress. Low counts can be seen if there's suppression of the immune system. The white blood cells involved are neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils and basophils. You can see here the wee abbreviations, neut, lymph, mono, eosin, and basophils. And these are different types of white blood cells in the blood, usually called a differential in conjunction with the total white cell count. The levels give information with the immune system. The neutrophils and lymphocytes are the most important levels to measure. The other three types are less significant and often measured together. So in this slide you can see the blood reference ranges for adults. So every laboratory will have this, and this is known. So you can see for the males and the females their blood cell count. The males are higher. The hemoglobin as well is quite higher. You have the hematocrit, which is higher as well. The white blood cells count as well, and the platelet count. So these are these are the normal reference ranges. So when you get your lab results back in the laboratory, they will look at these and see whether it's normal, less, or high, and they can make conclusions regarding this as to what the diagnosis is, as long as well as other symptoms and further tests if necessary. So you also have the urea and creatinine test, which is used to assess kidney function. So high levels of urea can be present in dehydration. You have total protein, which measures several different proteins of albumin being the most abundant type in the blood. Changes in total protein concentration are common and can be due to nutritional causes or general illness. Albumin can also be measured, so low albumin levels can be seen in conditions resulting in protein loss, reduction in synthesis, abnormal distribution of albumin. High levels are often a result of dehydration or even prolonged application of a tonicate at a time of synthesis. Look at the intra and extracellular ion concentration. So for the extracellular interstitial fluid, you can see sodium is quite high on the outside where it goes down quite low in the, in the intracellular. And then potassium is quite high intracellular, quite low out on the uh, extracellular. Calcium and chloride ions are also present and calcium levels are decreased in the intracellular. And the uh, chlorine levels are also decreased. Protein is also more present in the intracellular. So the sodium potassium involves the resting membrane potential if you're aware of how the, how the process is, free sodiums in and two potassiums out. Moving on from that, but still related to sodium potassium, here's a wee diagram of another test that was quite important in testing the laboratory, aldosterone. So aldosterone is involved in sodium potassium function. So aldosterone targets the kidneys. It's released from the adrenal cortex. When it does, sodium levels decrease and blood potassium levels increase. So it targets the kidneys, as I said, and then sodium is reabsorbed by the kidneys and the blood sodium potassium levels normalise or the potassium levels are released. So how the steroid is evolved in your blood pressure. For more referencing ranges, referencing ranges for serum, you see for sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, magnesium, urea, creatinine, albumin, total proteins and morality. So these are all measured in the laboratory. 
I'll be making more videos in, in the future as well, explaining why all these tests are done and what's the purpose of it, what sort of uh, results can be expected, etc. What sort of treatment, well that's going to be in a wee while actually. Well, quite a lot of topics cover for that. Briefly, I'll talk about salt imbalances regarding sodium, potassium, calcium and magnesium. So if sodium levels are increased, that's called hyponatremia. This is because of excessive loss of water through the gastrointestinal system, lungs or skin, fluid restriction, certain GI irritates, hypotonic IV solutions, tube feeding, hypothalamic lesions, hyperaldosteronism, cortisol, use and cushion syndrome and diabetes insipidus. For potassium, we can get hypotolemia, aldosterone deficiency, sodium depletion, acidosis, trauma, hemolysis, hemolysis of red blood cells, or potassium sparing diuretics. For calcium, we can have hypercalcemia, excessive vitamin D, immobility, hyperparathyroidism, potassium sparing diuretics, antigen converting antigen, antigen converting enzyme inhibitors, and malignancy of the bone or blood. For magnesium, if the levels are elevated, you can get excessive use of magnesium containing antacids and laxatives. Untreated diabetic ketoacidosis, excess magnesium infusions. So these are the reasons why you could end up with hyponatremia, hypotolemia, hypocalcemia, and hypomagnesia. On the other hand, if these levels are decreased, for sodium, you get hyponatremia, resulting from congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrosis, excess fluid intake syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, which is dilution or hyponatremia, sodium depletion, loss of body fluids of a replacement, diuretic therapy, laxative, neogastric suctioning, hyperaldosteronism, cerebral salt washing disease. Potassium, we end up with hypokalemia, which is due to lack of dietary intake of potassium, vomiting, nasal, nasogastric suctioning, potassium depletion, diuretic, aldosteronism, salt washing kidney disease, major gastrointestinal surgery, diuretic therapy with inadequate potassium replacement. If you end up with hypocalcemia due to the juice calcium levels, this can be because of hypoparathyroidism, malabsorption, and insufficient or inactivated vitamin D, or inadequate intake of calcium, hypoalbuminia, diuretic therapy, diarrhea, acute pancreatitis, bone cancer, gastric surgery. And if you end up with reduced magnesium levels due to hypomagnesia, this is due to malabsorption related to the GI disease, excessive loss of GI fluids, acute alcoholism, cirrhosis, diuretic therapy, hypo or hypothyroidism, pancreatitis, pee and calamsia, nasogastric suctioning, and fistula drainage. Also measuring the body are abnormal gases and pH. So I'll touch upon this fully in another video. But this can be due to acidosis, so respiratory and metabolic or kidney components. So respiratory acidosis involves a low pH and increased partial carbon dioxide rate. Respiratory disease such resulting from pneumonia, uh, chronic obsessive pulmonary disorder or over sedation such from opiates. You can get metabolic acidosis where you have a low pH and decreased bicarbonate. And this can come from diabetes, shock or kidney failure. For alkalosis, which is respiratory me the metabolic, for respiratory alkalosis, you can have a higher pH, a decreased partial carbon dioxide due to overventilation, pain, panic. And for, and for metabolic acid alkalosis, you can have elevated pH and increased bicarbonate, hypokalemia due to low blood potassium, chronic vomiting, losing acid from the stomach, and sodium bicarbonate overdose. So this is just an overview of all the tests that are undertaken in biochemistry the laboratory. I'll be doing more videos on this and how these diseases are undertaken, etc., and what to look for. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the videos.